tonight on Arirang News Center. North Korea expels South Korean nationals from the jointly run Kaesong Industrial Park and vows to freeze all South Korean assets at the complex in response to Seoul's shutdown of operations. North Korea declares Kaesong Industrial Complex a military control area. South Korea's military steps up readiness along the nation's western coast. And slowing Chinese economy, nose-diving oil prices in now North Korea. We take a look at how the South Korean economy is faring in the wake of various challenges. It's Thursday, February 11, 2016. to our viewers in Korea. Hello to those around the world. This is News Center. All South Koreans have uh, returned or are beginning to return from the joint industrial complex at the, uh, at the Kaesong Park. For details of that statement released by Pyongyang uh, late this afternoon and what's going on in the inter-Korean ties, let's go live to our Unification Ministry correspondent Connie Kim at Seoul's Unification Ministry. Now, Connie, give us the details of what's been happening all this afternoon. Well, Konyang, uh, we're starting the newscast with some uh, very good news. This is coming in from Seoul's Unification Ministry. Some 280 South Korean workers inside the Kaesong Industrial Complex have returned safely back to the South. Now, uh, there were 184 South Koreans inside the industrial park on Thursday, and there were concerns of another inter-Korean tension. As North Korea said, it will expel South Koreans at 5.30 p.m. South Korean time. Uh, Seoul's, uh, Seoul's Unification Ministry said it will do its best to bring back its citizens safely from the complex. It seems like ministry officials have made their last efforts to bring them back. So fortunately, we won't be seeing any South Koreans detained inside the complex. Now, Connie, earlier in the day, North Korea announced that it will expel all South Koreans from the inter-Korean industrial complex and freeze all South Korean assets. Uh, the announcement was rather abrupt, right? Well, it was indeed, Kanyang. Uh, the announcement from North Korea came half an hour before uh, the last time slot scheduled for South Koreans to come out of Kaesong. In a statement from North Korea's uh, Committee for the Peaceful Reunification of Korea on Thursday, Pyongyang said it is closing down the complex and designating the area as a military control zone. The inter-Korean military hotline will also be cut off. It also added it will be freezing all assets and equipment held by the South Korean companies operating in the complex. The statement released by <clears throat> the North also slammed Seoul for saying that Pyongyang took advantage of the operations in advancing its missile capabilities. Now, the, the measure come as South Korea on Wednesday said it will suspend operations at the park in response to Seoul's, uh, in response to Pyongyang's nuclear test and long-range missile launch. Seoul said the suspension is aimed at cutting off money for further nuclear and missile development. Now, Connie, uh, this, is, this is day one for the South Korean businessmen uh, withdrawing their workers from the inter-Korean industrial park. One and only, actually, because uh, Seoul announced that it's suspending operations there. But uh, North <coughs> Korea, in fact, expelled all of them as of today. I wonder how the businessmen are taking uh, this, this news. Well, earlier in the day, Gonyang, I was in the inter-Korean transit office in Paju, where I got to meet some of the South Korean businessmen that were planning to go inside the complex today. And I got to hear uh, what they had to say about Seoul's decision to shut down the complex. Take a look. A day after South Korea announced it was shutting down the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex, South Koreans with businesses in the park set out for the North Korean border town early on Thursday morning to start withdrawing their workers and equipment. With Pyongyang having agreed to Seoul's proposed schedule for moving its workers in and out of Kaesong, a total of 132 South Koreans were able to enter the complex. 
On their way in, business owners expressed a mixture of disappointment and anger over Seoul's decision to close down the last remaining symbol of inter-Korean economic cooperation. South Koreans with factories at the complex are trying their best, but what we got is a sudden notice to pull out. What did we do wrong? The country would be better off if the companies were allowed to prosper. We have about a two-month supply of products stored up. If the government had given us some kind of notice beforehand, we could have balanced our production. I personally don't think it will be easy for the industrial park to reopen after this. That prediction could very well prove true. When the South Koreans arrived at the complex, it was as if North Korea had told its workers not to report for duty. Some 280 buses reportedly arrived at the complex as usual, but all of them were empty inside. The North Korean workers did their jobs as usual on Wednesday. They followed the orders given by the South Koreans, but they didn't know about the suspension until they left work that day. They were probably notified today. Although some of the factory and company owners entering the complex were willing to share their thoughts on the shutdown on their way in, most of those returning from Kezong remained tight-lipped about the situation and seemed reluctant to comment. We respect the government's orders and have no choice but to listen to the Kezong Industrial District Management Committee. Now that, now that all South Koreans have returned back to the South safely, Seoul is seeking to resolve the issue of unpaid wage issues now. So we'll have to see how that development unfolds. Kanye? All right, thanks, Connie. That was our Connie Kim from the nation's unification ministry. Now, on to Seoul's defense ministry. Uh, Seoul's defense ministry has been keeping a close watch or eye on the developing situation on the Korean Peninsula. Let's go live to our Kwon Jang Ho. He is standing by at the Ministry of National Defense. Uh, Chang Ho, tell us uh, what has North Korea said regarding the shutdown of the Kesan complex today? Hi, Kwon Young. As uh, Connie just said, North Korea has pulled its workers from the uh, complex earlier today and declared it a military zone. This is after the South suspended its operations in reaction to the ballistic missile launch on Sunday. All border crossings have been closed off as well, and Pyongyang also said it was shutting down the cross-border communications hotline between Seoul and Pyongyang. The regime also called Seoul's suspension of activities a dangerous declaration of war. Now, um, how have the uh, South Korean military reacted? How are they getting ready for any kind of um, interruptions on the Korean Peninsula? Well, military readiness levels had already been heightened since the missile launch on Sunday. But South Korean government officials said that they had stepped up vigilance along the inter-Korean border and that they are ready for any provocation from the north. But although, although there was noticeably more North Korean troops at the complex during the day, there has been no sign of any extra troop mo movement elsewhere. So far, the communist state has only responded with its propaganda broadcasts through its border loudspeakers, as well as scattering of propaganda flyers. Nevertheless, South Korean military officials said they are staying alert for any unexpected provocation, especially at night. They also said that military readiness levels will stay high until all South Korean citizens are safely taken away from the industrial park. Well, uh, Chang, uh, with, with tensions already so high, is there a chance of any further escalation? Well, the U.S. has stepped up its uh, support for South Korea, and it remains to be seen how the North will react to this. A military official said today that a U.S. Navy nuclear-powered submarine, the USS North Carolina, will be approaching the peninsula by next week. The U.S. is reportedly considering deploying B-2 stealth bombers and F-22 Raptor stealth fighters as well. Talks on the deployment of THAAD, the U.S.-built anti-ballistic missile system in South Korea, has also been stepped up. And there are still plans for Seoul and Washington to hold their biggest ever joint military drills sometime this year. This has been Kwon jang at the South Korean Defense Ministry. Now, over in Parliament, South Korea's political parties also had their respective responses to the latest development at the inter-Korean joint industrial complex in Kaesong. Our senior parliamentary correspondent, Shimeong-gil, is on the line. 
Myung-gil, tell us the latest reactions from Parliament. Right, Kan Young, the ruling Senate Party said Thursday that it respects the government's decision to close the inter-Korean Gaesong Industrial Complex, adding that North Korea had brought the current situation on itself. The ruling party said it was an inevitable measure, as the party has const constantly warned North Korea to end this vicious cycle of provocations. The ruling party said the responsibility for the closure of the joint industrial complex lies with the Kim Jong-un's regime. Concerning South Korean businesses, the ruling party called on the government to make utmost efforts to minimize the damages to the firms. Myung-gil, what about across the political aisle? What was the main opposition party's stance towards this? Yes, the main opposition Minju Party of Korea still kept a stance that Seoul's government should reconsider their decision to shut down the joint industrial complex. In a press release by spokesperson Kim song su he emphasized that North Korea's provocations will only exacerbate security threats in Northeast Asia and urged Pyongyang to refrain from such provocations. The party also said people who work there have been saying the complex was a miraculous place that had the potential to expedite Korean reunification, and closing the complex will derail the South Korean government's achieve achievements until now. The party is also concerned that such measures will eventually lead to the complex's permanent closure. In addition, the minor opposition People's Party is also against the shutdown, which it said is akin to the country choosing to self-sanction itself because it won't have any effect on North Korea and will only hurt the South Korean companies with factories in the complex. This has been Jim Young-gye reporting from the National Assembly. And on to foreign experts' view on the latest series of events today surrounding the inter-Korean joint industrial complex in Kaesong. Dr. Kim Yeonuk, professor at Korean National and Diplomatic Academy, joins us live in the studio. Professor Kim, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Now, the two Koreas now appear to be in for some tit-for-tat escalation of measures. Um, at this point, North Korea vowed that um, or expelled all South Korean personnel from the Kaesong Industrial Complex and uh, vowed to uh, uh, freeze all the assets left there, which will be equipment and inventory and all those things for South Korean companies. Uh, what are North Korea's intentions at this point? Uh, well, this is very uh, harsh and uh, strong measures by North Korea. Uh, I think this kind of crisis atmosphere is something that uh, North Korea clearly has some intentions about. Uh, first intention is that uh, recently, you know, Kim Jong-un uh, purged another high-level military officer, uh, which means that still his power is not completely solid yet. So I think, uh, you know, by making some crisis atmosphere domestically, I think he is now still trying to, trying to consolidate his power. Uh, I think he has some more intentions vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, recently, by international communities, pressure on China to pose more harsh sanctions on no North Korea. I think North Korea is giving some signs to China. Hey, uh, if you give us some sanctions, we, if China is not on the side of North Korea, maybe the Korean Peninsula would be, you know, experiencing another instability, which is a big concern for China. And also, there might be some uh, signals to the United States, too. Uh, recently, U.S. Uh, Senate has passed a bill which is very, includes very strong sanction measures vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. Um, you know, there is a, a you know, widespread uh, mood in the U.S. Congress and Senate that the Obama government's strategic patience has been a failure. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, strong measures uh, which is uh, against the strategic patience is some kinds of things that uh, you know North Korea is trying to make inside the United States. The anti-movement, anti-failing vis-a-vis uh, strategic patience policy of the Obama government. So uh, basically a message both internally and within North Korea and message to uh, uh, overseas as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Was South Korea expecting such, such level of move such, um, and so quickly as well? Well, uh, it has been very abrupt, I know. Uh, this is something that is very surprising thing. Uh, but uh, this kinds of uh, tit-for-tat uh, move by North Korea is something that I think would have been expected. Uh, when, uh, when there was a Kim Gang Mountain uh, tourism thing, uh, you know, resumption dialogue, 
the dialogue was halted. And afterwards, North Korea froze its uh, assets inside the uh, Gimgang Mountain tourism area. And also in uh, 2013, when there was third nuclear test of North Korea and U.S.-South Korea military exercises, uh, North Korea uh, at that time also frozen the uh, assets within the uh, Gaston complex. So I think uh, this kind of response from North Korea is something that the uh, Korean government has expected. Right, as a freeze, uh, you mentioned Mount Kumgang incident uh, and North Korea's seizure of all South Korean assets there back in 2010. Now, is the latest measure by Pyongyang on that scale? Is it something on that scale? And how will this hit South Korean firms uh, which had operations at the Kaesong Industrial Complex? Well, I think uh, the economic um, uh, loss would be much higher than the uh, you know, 2013 Kumgang Mountain uh, you know, event. Uh, at that time, I think the uh, companies, Korean companies, lost economic loss. I think it was almost two billion U.S. dollars, mm -hmm. and this time I think it would be more than three U.S. billion dollars. I think mm -hmm. so. Um, you know, all the uh, facilities within the gas and complex, and also uh, the commodity sales benefits, and also some of the production facilities, uh, commodities uh, left, and raw materials. All these kinds of uh, things would be a huge economic loss to the companies. So what can the South Korean government do to minimize the losses for South Korean firms? I think uh, South Korean government, what the South Korean government can do is to, uh, you know, to, uh, to give emergency funds to the companies, uh, maybe some, uh, give, provide some uh, insurance benefits to the companies, uh, exempt some taxes from those companies, and also uh, give some special loans to the companies, all that kind of measures. But I don't think these measures will be enough to, uh, to, to uh, you know, pay back all the losses of those companies. I mean, we cannot but wonder, what about North Korea? Does it think that it has nothing to lose from this? I'm sure it has much to lose from the, uh, the suspension of the joint industrial park. What is North Korea's loss there? Well, I think uh, North Korea would be thinking of uh, using all those f facilities and uh, workers for other purposes. I mean, think about it, the, the Gumgang Mountain cases, all the assets left in the Gumgang Mountain tourism area, they use it to, to bring all the Chinese and other foreign tourists to the Gumgang Mountain. So I think this time, maybe North Korea is thinking about using the facilities and workers uh, at the uh, Gaesan complex area uh, so that they can make some commodities and export to China or some other company, countries. So make use of the equipment and everything left there, mm -hmm, the infrastructure mm -hmm. that South Korea built mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. um, what does this mean for future inter-Korean relations? I mean, uh, North Korea declared the Kaesong Industrial Park Zone a military control area. It cut off all communication lines. Also, um, it blamed South Korea for the state of, of, of war. Uh, what, what's in the forecast? Uh, we have like uh, what uh, two or three days uh, afterwards. Uh, it's uh, Kim Jong Il's uh, birthday. Uh, in March, we will have uh, U.S. South Korea joint military exercises, full legal and key resolve. Uh, April, it's uh, Kim Il Sung's birthday. May, it's a party convention in North Korea. So I think all these uh, series of events would signify that North Korea would continue very strong measures vis-a-vis -vis South Korea and, and, and ex escalate the crisis in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we can recall what happened in 2010 uh, in which there were Chonan ship and Yeonpyeong Island artillery cases. At that time, two Koreas almost went into war. The crisis was very high. But uh, next year, in January 2011, the United States and China had a summit meeting and, and, and em emphasized that the stability and peace in the Korean Peninsula is very important. So maybe North Korea is uh, thinking about that kind of pattern again. If North Korea escalates crisis, maybe afterwards uh, the U.S. and South Korea would, hey, uh, we, can't, we can't tolerate anymore. We want a dialogue. But this time, unfortunately, the U.S. and South Korea is very determined. Uh, you know, you know, we, we will just push forward and sanctions and pressures. So it's a chicken game now. I'm worrying about the future. All right, Professor Kim Yonuk, thank you indeed for coming into our studio and speaking with us tonight. Thank you very much.
President Park Geun-hye is likely to hold a trilateral summit with U.S. President Barack Obama and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in Washington on the sidelines of the nuclear security summit set to take place in late March. Tokyo's uh, GG Press report is citing a Japanese government official that the leaders will need to strengthen ties and seek strong collaborative countermeasures against North Korea's weapons program. Now, the Korean president spoke with both leaders over the phone on Tuesday regarding North Korea's missile launch, during which the leaders pledged to cooperate in implementing strong and effective sanctions on Pyongyang and vowed for separate bilateral and multilateral measures outside of the UN Security Council resolutions. In addition to the suspension of the Kaesong Industrial Complex, South Korea is moving forward with its efforts to drum up support for strong sanctions in North Korea. To that end, Seoul's Foreign Affairs Minister met with the UN Security Council members, some of whom have already announced independent sanctions on Pyongyang. Our Foreign Affairs correspondent Kwon Sua reports. The international sanctions to be imposed on North Korea need to be at a level that far exceeds the regime's imagination. This is what South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon byung se told reporters in New York on Wednesday after meeting with all 15 UN Security Council members during his two-day trip to the UN headquarters. We expect a strong and effective action towards sanctions. To summarize what I told the council members, this time, we need a terminating resolution. Minister Yoon said the vicious cycle of provocations and resolutions will continue if the sanctions are too weak. In a meeting with UN Security Council representatives from the U.S., China, Japan and Russia, he emphasized that South Korea made a critical decision by suspending the Kaesong Industrial Complex. This reference was seen as a bid to change China and Russia's lukewarm attitude towards strong sanctions against Pyongyang. During his stay, Yoon also emphasized the need for individual countries to impose their own independent sanctions. Something the U.S. is actively pursuing as the Senate unanimously passed the toughest sanctions ever on North Korea Wednesday, aimed at derailing the regime's drive for ever more advanced nuclear weapons. The legislation before us today represents the tough response that is necessary to send this message directly to North Korean leaders, disarm or face severe economic sanctions. Japan has announced new sanctions as well, including a ban on North Korean ships entering Japanese ports and restrictions on people taking cash in excess of 900 U.S. dollars to North Korea. A senior official at Seoul's foreign ministry says more countries are sharing the view that the point has been reached where cash flow into the north has to be hindered to cripple the regime's nuclear and missile programs. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. The South Korean Navy has recovered debris from the North Korean missile that was launched on Sunday. The recovered parts are suspected to be from the missile engine nozzle, while the rocket as a whole was first televised in the north on Thursday, showing the missile taking off from the regime's main launch site. And in reaction to the latest North Korean provocation, a rare Joint Chiefs of Staff meeting was held between South Korea, U.S. and Japan today. Lee ji has more. Debris from the North Korean missile was recovered and unveiled at the Pyeongtaek port on Thursday. Four pieces were found on the ocean floor about 100 kilometers from Ocheongdo Island in the West Sea. A cylindrical piece with a diameter of about 2 meters and suspected to be a joint for a rocket propellant was seriously damaged with rust and paint coming apart in various sections. Two other pieces are believed to be from the missile's engine nozzle, while the fourth piece to be the outer layer of the nozzle. The Navy has been working around the clock since Tuesday to recover the items using salvage ships and unmanned remotely operated vehicles. Other pieces from the first and second stages of the long-range missile were recovered on Monday, as well as fragments of the payload fairing that were picked up on the launch day. They will now be sent to the agency for defense development for analysis. The recovery of the pieces comes as a North state-run Korean Central Television released video footage of Sunday's launch, showing the missile at various angles as it took off from the Dongcheongli launch site. 
Meanwhile, a rare Joint Chiefs of Staff meeting was held among the highest-ranking military officials from South Korea, the U.S., and Japan via video conference. The three have once again confirmed that North Korea has violated U.N. Security Council resolutions. The three allies have vowed to cooperate in sharing information on North Korea real-time. They also discussed the possibility of the U.S. deploying more military support to South Korea. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. With uh, lingering uncertainties at home and abroad, South Korean shares were in for a hit on the first day of trading after the long holiday weekend. While officials say North Korea's latest provocation is unlikely to have much of an impact on the local market, external risks could. Kim In-ji takes a closer look. The South Korean market was no exception to the global market downturn, feeling the impact of a series of internal and external risks that emerged over the extended holiday period. On the domestic front, North Korea launched a long-range missile on Sunday, and in response, South Korea suspended all operations at the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex, a major source of income for the communist state. While the general consensus is that the North's latest provocation had a limited impact on the local financial market, the poor health of the global economy is dealing it a significant blow. In Seoul, the benchmark KOSPI closed sharply lower, shedding almost 3 percent on the first day of trading following the Lunar New Year holiday. Meanwhile, the Korean won closed at 1,202 won against the U.S. dollar, weakening by roughly three-tenths of a percent. The local bourse hasn't been able to avoid the global market volatility seen during the holiday break. There's growing negative sentiment against global stimulus policies as they haven't been able to prop up the economy. Major stock markets around the world, especially Japan, have recently lost ground. The benchmark Nikkei lost more than 7 percent over two days. On Thursday, Hong Kong's Hang Seng, which reopened after the holiday break, also shed almost 4 percent. In addition, there's been lingering uncertainty stemming from China's slow growth, as well as an ongoing decline in global oil prices. South Korea's finance ministry said it's keeping a close eye on local and global markets and vowed to convene a market review meeting every day until conditions show signs of stabilization. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Despite the tensions over in Seoul um, and then Pyongyang uh, deciding to withdraw from the inter-Korean industrial complex of Kaesong, the provisional session uh, kicked off at South Korea's National Assembly today. Lawmakers are expected to try and reach a compromise over a number of contentious bills to end the current legislative paralysis. Shin Se-min has the latest. The National Assembly kicked off a provisional session on Thursday, and lawmakers are seeking to make progress on a number of contentious bills that await approval. They've reached a somewhat silent consensus on the need to pass the bills, but what they're hoping for is a breakthrough before the next regular session starts on February 19th. With the passage of the corporate revitalization plan, known as the One Shot Act, what's left are the labor reform bills and bills on improving the service sector, among others. And we will put extra effort into getting those bills passed. The basic structure for a compromise is out, meaning that we and the Senate Party are inching closer to reaching a conclusion if the ruling party agrees to embrace our proposals. Up until now, little to no progress has been made on bills related to labor reform, counterterrorism measures, the service sector, and redrawing Korea's electoral map. But with a general election scheduled for April 13th and some lawmakers already worrying over potential postponement, lawmakers are running out of time. If the rival parties fail to conclude talks on the matter by Friday, the National Assembly Speaker Chong Iwa will put his electoral proposal for a floor vote next Thursday at regular session as previously announced. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Russia has reportedly devised plans for a ceasefire in Syria from next month. 
Bruce Harrison is live in the studio with me for more. Now, but the, Bruce, uh, the news comes amid a massive bombing campaign by Russia in support of the Syrian army. Where does the, uh, the peace process stand in Syria? Hi, Kan Yang. Well, what we've heard is that a, a, a Western official was told by Russia that they have devised some plans that would start uh, from March 1st. But according to Reuters, that official says Washington's concerned about parts of this deal and no agreement's been reached. So not a lot of progress as we can see so far. Uh, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, he's been uh, pushing for peace talks. He's now in Germany for the Syrian peace talks. Yeah, he's at an annual uh, conference in Munich that they talk about uh, uh, national security, and they're expected to discuss Syria while he's over there. Uh, he said he hopes to secure an agreement uh, on a ceasefire that would allow humanitarian aid into Syria as soon as this week. Uh, but he and other world powers are competing with the Syrian government. That's leading a push with ally Russia for an all-out military victory. The Syrian government spokesman at the talks says the West talks about fighting terrorism, but only Syria and its allies are actually accomplishing that. That is why the legitimate government in Syria and the sovereign decision in Syria must be respected. Whoever wants to fight terrorism should join the Syrian army facing terrorism. Syrian government forces backed by Russian airstrikes and other supporting forces have launched a major offensive in the countryside around the city of Aleppo where at least 500 people have been killed in fighting this month. The Russian Defense Ministry says its jets carried out 510 military sorties in Syria during, uh, over the past week but claims U.S. planes bombed Aleppo on Wednesday. A 94-year-old former guard at the notorious Nazi prison camp Auschwitz is on trial in Germany. Reinhold Hanning is accused of being an accessory to the murder of at least 170,000 people. Hanning's is the first of four such court cases. It could be the last due to the very old age of the defendants. Because of Hanning's age, his condition to stand trial was called into question. Shortly before the start of this trial, the court asked an expert to once again examine the defendant. The expert confirmed that the defendant is fit to face trial for two hours per day. Hanning was 20 years old in 1942 when he began serving as a guard at the Auschwitz death camp in occupied Poland. Right. It's, it's really remarkable how it's seven decades later, more than seven decades later, uh, Germans are still going after those uh, Nazi, I, I suppose, Nazi supporters um, and putting them onto trial. Well, as I said, he's the first of four cases going forward, two other men and one woman guards at that same camp that are going to be tried. Uh, sentences I haven't been decided yet. Some of these people have only gotten several years because of their significant age. Right, war criminals on trial, something to think about in this part of the region. All right, Bruce, thank you so much for today. My pleasure. We surely had spring-like conditions today, but it might just be too soon to put away our winter gear. For more on the latest weather update, let's go over to our Yi Jihan. Jihan, what's with the spring weather? Well, Kanyang, but as you said, it was indeed very warm today with Jeju Island seeing its high going up to 19.5 degrees Celsius, while Seoul topped out at 13.5. Now, nearly 20 degrees Celsius in Jeju, uh, that, but that's, uh, that seems like spring to me. But rainy days are in the forecast. That's right. In fact, Jeju has already been hit by showers this evening, and Seoul will also receive precipitation shortly, and whole nation will have rainy days until Saturday. And we are expecting moderate amounts of rainfall, but quite heavy at times in the central regions, including here in Seoul, where precipitation could go up to 80 millimeters so be sure to have umbrellas prepared. But despite the rain, temperatures will not drop much and cloud cover will keep temperatures steady overnight. So daily low here in Seoul will start out at 7 degrees Celsius, 6 for Daegu and Busan will start out the day at 10. And as for the daily highs, Seoul will top out at 11, 12 for Daegu and Busan and Jeju will see a high of 14 and 19. Uh, but starting Sunday, we are expecting a brief cold snap so as Konyong say don't put away your winter coats just yet. 
Now that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. Now, we are getting reports that all South Korean personnel, nearly 200 of them, who have been remaining at the inter-Korean Kaesang Industrial Complex, have crossed the military demarcation line down to the south to South Korea, all safe as of 10 p.m. Korea time, so that was about 35 minutes ago. So all South Korean personnel are clear of the Kaesang Industrial Complex um, in the North Korean city of Kaesang. That is our broadcast on this Thursday night. I leave you on that note. I'm Moon Gun Young. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you right back here, same time tomorrow on News Center.